Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual I'll start with a couple of um, announcements. First of all, advanced study for the month of December actually starts tomorrow night and I'm covering an enor a, a, just an amazing book by a guy by the name of Richard Ablin called The Great Prostate Hoax. Richard Ablin is the researcher who discovered prostate specific antigen or PSA. And as most of you know, PSA testing is done routinely for men starting at earlier and earlier ages. This book explains why that is a bad idea. And remember, this book is written by the guy who discovered PSA. So as usual, two classes this month. First one's tomorrow, December 3rd. Uh, as usual, there will be slides so that you can understand the material and you don't have to take notes. Interactive conference call, you can ask questions. Every month I pick a book I think you should read, but I know that you won't, and I cover it this way and that way. You guys get to know what I know, all right? The other thing is that uh, this week we'll be uh, doing video footage for the first time of our annual tree decorating party uh, that is always really fun at the Wallace Farm. Del makes cookies and there's a special story behind the ornaments on the tree that we'll tell you about. And it's just time for fun and frivolity. Uh, even uh, Kelly's dog Ringo comes dressed in costume, Santa hat and all, so we'll post it on the members site next week and you guys will have fun with it. All right, I have two things to talk about today. Uh, one is um, a, a, an article about dairy intake, and then another is an article about more effective ways to get people to make better choices. So they're sort of related, all right? So I'll start with the dairy one. Lots of reasons not to eat dairy. The big one is the increased risk of many types of cancer. And the study I'm gonna talk about was unusual because it dealt with lactose intolerant patients and their risk of cancer and showed that lactose intolerant patients who generally consume less dairy because they're lactose intolerant have lower risk of lung, breast, and ovarian cancer. So where the patients came from is the Swedish Cancer Registry. And through the registry, the researchers were able to identify 22,788 people who were lactose intolerant, and they looked at their risk of developing various types of cancer. The researchers concluded, quote, in this large cohort study, people with lactose intolerance characterized by low consumption of milk and other dairy products had decreased risks of lung, breast, and ovarian cancers, but the decreased risks were not found in family members, suggesting that the protective effect against these cancers is related to their specific dietary pattern. The researchers did qualify their statement and say that it was an association between dairy and cancer, not establishing cause and effect relationship, but two things. The first one is that lots of studies have shown this association and lots of studies have also identified the mechanism of action. And there are many of them, but one I'll point out, and it was actually mentioned in the article, is that dairy, dairy protein increases uh, circulating levels of insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1, which is a risk factor for cancer in adults. So um, we have cause and effect relationship established. This is just one more manifestation of what that's all about. People who eat less dairy products have less incidence of these types of, of cancer and many others too. So remember cow's milk is for cows. If you're not a baby cow, don't drink it, don't eat the products, all right? So now the issue becomes how do we get people to do the right thing, pick the right foods, and that's the struggle, I suppose, reaching people and then getting them to be compliant on a, on a good diet. And I think there's general acknowledgement that most diets don't work. I think we get pretty good compliance on ours for a variety of reasons, but a new study suggests that maybe we should focus more on the emotional aspects of eating than we should on actually nutrition education, how to read labels, and all that sort of thing. So researchers from three universities conducted four studies that were designed to evaluate the role of emotions in food choices and if those changing those responses, emotional responses to food, could be used as a means for improving food choices. The studies involved varying numbers of undergraduate students who, through testing, were identified as individuals most at risk of making poor food choices. The training involved small groups of six to 10 participants who were randomized to either get the training or they were in a control group. The training was general and it included a lot of consumer situations, not just those that involved food. And the training focused on perceiving, facilitating, understanding, and managing emotion. Now, if I, I don't wanna recite the whole study to you, so let's just talk about what the study showed. The study showed that emotional ability 
could be improved through training, that people could learn better skills, all right? That food choices were improved as a result, that emotional training was better than nutrition training and helping people to make better food choices, and that emotional ability training increased goal-oriented thoughts while reducing the, like, un, the likelihood of making unhealthy food choices based on their taste. Emotionally trained individuals who were in the intervention group lost more weight during a three-month period, they ate fewer calories, and they chose healthier foods. So the researchers concluded, quote, our training programs suggest that consumer education programs should reconsider their current emphasis on communicating factual information such as nutrition labels to instead stimulate experience-based learning that incorporates emotional ability. Now here's what I think about it. I think we have to do both things. People want to and need to understand the relationship between diet and health in order to make good decisions. And I have said for many, many years that taking control of your health is not doing what I say instead of what somebody else says. It's looking at all the information and picking the choices that you think are best for you based on that information. So in order to do that, you need to understand the science behind dietary recommendations. Additionally, my experience has been the people who have had that type of training are less susceptible to the messages about dietary fads and you know, the things that people tell them. They're, they're more likely to stay the course. But on the other hand, ignoring other contributing factors to eating poorly, which include emotional uh, eating and emotions, results in failure. Our weight loss programs are populated with hundreds of people who know what to eat and why, but they're not doing it because they eat for the wrong reasons and they tell themselves inaccurate stories about why it's okay to do it. So the winning combination actually is the health-promoting diet with the education that explains why and how, and then strategies for dealing with the emotional issues. You marry those two together and then you have a winning program, all right? So I hope that makes some sense, and boy, we're coming upon a season when people tend to do more emotional eating than any other time of the year, myself included. And doing the, also, the other thing we all do is we eat because it's there. You, know, you think you're full, but that really looks fabulous, and you end up eating it anyway. So this is a time to be mindful about these kinds of things. So I'll just plant that idea in the back of your head, and, and hopefully you'll think about me when you're at the cocktail party, ready to dig into something you're not supposed to eat. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you again on Thursday with more news.